Well, welcome back to Waterproof Records. Today, we are joined by bassist Mancunian. Did I say that correctly? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jack Bates. Things are going to change. I can feel it. It just won't be that kind of body. Let's Hello. go. <laughs> How you doing, mate? I'm good. I'm doing good. I wanted to find out exactly what somebody from Manchester goes by. And Mancunian is the is the term? Is it something that's ever used over there? That is the term, but we would just say mank. <laughs> <laughs> mank. So you'd say I'm a mank. Totally, yes. All right, good. <laughs> so now when I go over there, I can blend right in and say Well, that's mank. it. Yeah. Now you, you can be an honorary mank whenever yes! you come. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> well, for my audience, you know, I'm here to educate as well as talk about bands and, and musicians and have people on the show. But for those of you who don't know about Jack, Jack is the son of legendary bass player Peter Hook. And uh, Peter Hook is the founder and bassist of legendary bands like uh, New Order and The Joy Division. So... Quite a legacy, you know? <laughs> yeah. One, one of my friends says, Peter Hook is basically the founder of the 80s. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. De- definitely, definitely. You probably, you probably at this point can't get through an interview or a conversation with anybody without somebody bringing up your dad, right? That's probably just go par for the course at this point, right? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, I've been playing in the band with my dad for the last 12 years. And uh, so he's, you know... The first, thing people, the first thing people want to talk about is him, which is totally cool. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to escape. And and yeah, Peter Hook and The Light, they're still playing shows, and they've been going since 2010. Yeah. And you play bass uh, with your dad quite frequently. Mm. But you're more, you know, I would say your latest gig, but it's been going on for, uh, going on seven years now, uh, yeah, b- being yeah. the touring <laughs> bassist for the Smashing Pumpkins. Yes, yeah, and and for people who follow this show and know my work, know that I'm I'm mildly familiar with the Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> I've heard of them, you know. I, I just know the radio hits, um, but that's that's incredibly exciting. And I want I want to talk a little bit about that, you know, getting involved with that band and just your mm-hmm. your growing up. And of course, the number one thing we got to talk about on Waterproof Records is what's that album that really you know knocked your socks off, changed your life. And when I asked Jack to, to tell me, you know, he had to take some time, like any good <laughs> b- music loving addict like we are, you have to take a minute. Somebody asks you that question and it's, mm. it's never an easy one, right? Because there's different chapters. Yeah. It took me a few days to uh, get to Absolutely. the bottom of it. But Absolutely. I have picked, I've, I've picked one. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and should we, maybe we should just start there and dig right into the, the album. So, so go ahead and share the album that you chose. Oh, he's got it on vinyl, too. So for those watching the show, it is Dinosaur Jr. Where you been? Look at that. He's got it. He's got it two times. I got it two times. You know what? I was what? Because I was thinking I'll, I'll dig it out because I'm very proud of my uh, one of them's an original. Mm-hmm. And this is a reissue. I haven't opened the reissue yet. Oh, but lovely. This this one is an original and uh, pop pink. vinyl. <sighs> I so love it. I'm, I'm quite proud of that one. So I thought I'd come and show it up. <laughs> yes, you have to. I mean, I am, I understand being proud of vinyl. Um, I often have doubles, you know, the ones that are like mm-hmm. the remasters, the reissues, like I have Siamese dream as the remaster. And then this one, I bought this one in the nineties. And so it's this red marbling oh, wow. Siamese dream and it's a, it's old school, you know? So I, I'm very proud of those, those records that we get that they're early pressings. Yeah. Mm. That's yeah, awesome. I was buzzing. I actually, I, it's been one of my favorite albums since I was a teenager. Yeah, and I, and I could never find an original one on vinyl. And I was on tour uh, with my dad. I think we were in Tampa, Florida, and there was this really cool uh, record shop across the road, literally directly opposite um, the venue, and it was called Daddy Cool Records. And nice. I bought it there, which was cool. And they so then as a in return for them finally having the album that i wanted we put one of their stickers on my dad's bass 
So their sticker nice. is like front and center on his base. So they were quite happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I bet. And it was actually it was actually on record store day as well when I got it. Yeah. That's so great. I love yeah. it. Well, uh, Dinosaur Jr. was a great choice. And I, I one thing that, you know, we're about 10 years apart, you and I. And so you mm-hmm. grew up during your teenage years a, a little bit later than I did. And so I was curious because this is a 1993 album. How did you discover it being as, you know, this was probably close to a decade later that you were stumbling across Dinosaur Jr.? Was it given to you? Was it shared? Uh, You know what? I think it was just a sort of a random, a random find through like maybe, I don't know if you had it in America, but over here there was a channel called MTV2, which was like yes. the, the alternative MTV2. Yeah. And the alternative to MTV. Like, mm-hmm. so you didn't get the pop, it was just the rock. Yes. And uh, I got a lot of stuff from from that sort of yeah. around that time when I, was a, when I was a teenager. So obviously I was only four when the album came out because I was right. born in 89. 89, um, yeah. So I found it later. But yeah, it was probably just randomly through uh, MTV. And then I remember I was um, still one of my favorite films ever is Wayne's World. Yes. And there's a, there's, <laughs> there's a bit in there's totally. a bit in Wayne's World too. Yeah. Where where Wayne and Garth go to meet Handsome Dan from the radio. I and remember. out there by Dinosaur Jr. is playing in the background. Oh, and, that's um, so good. And then I was like, oh, that's that song that I heard a while ago on MTV, and I liked. And I was like, all right, now I gotta go get the record. And then when I got the record, it just blew my mind. It's like, to me, the songs are great. Like they're, yeah. they're great songs anyway, but the thing that gets me is just the lead guitar playing on that album. Absolutely. Jay, Mas- Jay Mascus is one of my favorite guitar players. And although it probably might not be everyone's cup of tea, just, you know, the totally long winding solos. <laughs> I think it's awesome. Yeah. The guitar <laughs> solos on that album, it just blew me away. It yeah. still does. Like I'm out there, start chopping, and get me as well. Like, there's, there's like four guitar solos and get me. They just get better each time. So I know exactly. It was, it was that that because it's weird because um, I'm a massive fan of Dinosaur Junior, but obviously that album isn't the original lineup. It's basically just Jay Maskis playing everything with a couple of higher That's drums. Like, it's not it's not Lou Barlow and it's not Murph. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's just it just that's my favorite one. That's so cool. I, I'm so glad you chose it because it's <clears throat> for us uh, that were in the 90s and when it was coming out, this is one of those mm. bands that I, I at first, I found them on the second, I mean, not the second album. They have many, many albums, you know, besides this one. But we yeah, have, I think um, isn't, isn't Where You've Been is like the fifth or sixth. Of, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's quite it's quite a way in. Yeah, and I, I didn't even really hear anything by Dinosaur Jr. until Without a Sound in 94. Because mm. feel the, feel the pain was the one that was getting into the the MTV rotation and whatnot, and so that was around the time, and <clears throat> it was one of those songs that I liked it, but I don't think I don't remember getting it as a, a CD right away, and it was something that I would stumble upon more later. But you said a good point, which is MTV at this era that you were young was still, even though the main MTV was already becoming just a nightmare of reality TV shows and yeah. not music content, they were still attempting with this MTV two to give us the music and the people that were still, still looking for bands. And so it, it's exciting to know that people from your generation were still mm. getting fed some really amazing musicians. And that yeah. was the first thing I thought about when you said this record, I thought that is a guitar driven album with these swirling, you know, sometimes psychedelic, sometimes like old school solos and guitar bits. And I thought that's such a cool thing because when you're talking to a bass player, Mm -hmm. Nine times out of 10, you talk to a bass player and you think they're going to come back with, you know, with Flea or they're going to say something about Les Claypool, you know, something like that. (laughs) But you you chose Jay Maskus and this very guitar driven thing. And I think that that probably speaks to how you play bass, right? Well, what's interesting is, I guess, as a bass player, uh, Lou Barlow is one of my favorite bass players. Yeah. But my favorite Dinosaur Jr. album is not one that he's on, which is quite <laughs> weird. But <laughs> that's just the way it, that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. The ear likes what it likes, you know. Mm, so exactly. <laughs> I think is it is it Mike? Yeah, Mike Johnson plays bass yeah. on this one. Yeah. Yeah, because Lou. I think Jay Maskis plays bass on some of it too, and even plays drums. Yeah. Yeah, he did a lot of the um, instrumentation on that, and, and yeah, it's, still, it's essentially a, a solo album, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but that t- you know that happens, and sometimes that's when a real through <laughs> line and vision becomes very clear 
I think mm-hmm. I, I think that there there is a magic to be had of when you have a band and a bunch of ideas come together. But in an artist's career, if they get the opportunity to be like, I'm going to just from start to finish every piece of music, it's going to be me. Then sometimes that very specific vision and sound is is like, wow, this is exactly what Jay Maskus wanted to put out. You know? Well, yeah, I guess there's a few things like that, isn't it? Like the first the first Foo Fighters album, he played everything himself he obviously that's had what a i was thinking of, what, of too what yeah. he wanted it to be and you know now they're one of the biggest stadium rock bands in the world so absolutely <laughs> he obviously did something right yeah absolutely and it's just you know i know that even in the current band that you're in now you know touring mm-hmm. with um billy has had to oftentimes make those harder decisions with the lineup changes and really focus in and i'm sure that's you know that comes through on some of the music that the band has put out over the years that it has a very specific like this is how i wanted it to to sound from start to finish now of course mm-hmm. a lot of it has been collaborative because of his you know forever connection to jimmy and james and and whatnot, but uh, but yeah. So there's there's a little bit of that from musicians, and it's exciting to hear. But but Dinosaur Junior, great album, great choice. So when you first heard it, yeah. were you were you already playing bass this time? Were you already playing? Uh, probably just about. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I, I first started playing bass when I was twelve. Yeah. But on not seriously, and then yeah. probably started seriously playing when I was like thirteen, fourteen, which would have been about two thousand two, two thousand three. So. That was probably when I was watching MTV too. Yeah. Around that time and finding out a lot of bands. And that got me into like obviously Dinosaur Jr. on a Seattle band, but all all my favorite bands and well, the rest of them are all from Seattle, really. Yeah. <laughs> it was like it was like Dinosaur Jr., Smashing Pumpkins, and then all the Seattle bands. That was what my uh totally my my teenage years were. And then yeah. I, but I do like a I like a lot of heavy stuff as well. So I was big into metal and and maybe that's where the love of guitar solos comes from. But I don't know. I just find, like, if you listen to most guitar solos from heavy metal bands, you know, it's just a shred, shred, shred. Totally. And that's cool. If you, I love that. And if you're in the mood for it, then great. But that one of the things that I like most about Where You've Been is that it has all the solos, but they're really melodic and they're almost like songs in themselves. Yeah. And especially, you know, each, each like, so there's, there's like four solos in, in uh, get me and each one you think oh it's incredible and then the next one just takes it up <laughs> and it's going one. yeah exactly and by the end it's just like melting faces yeah i'm a huge metal fan too i mean mm. i i i play guitar as well i started when i was around 12 and you know i was right as i was picking up the guitar it was in that changeover period where metallica's black album was dropping and at the same time we're getting nirvana so i was in this transition from going from the metal stuff to the alternative stuff but i still to this day i love those shredding solos but they they really only fit oftentimes in that genre of music you know it's like Mm. you rarely especially in the 90s it became uncool to solo. That was the thing yeah. It's like, if you were in a band, it was like, you know, wearing your flannel and you had a, a lead guitarist. It was like that solo better be the most like tame, you know, not unobtrusive thing. And it became almost lame to be <laughs> shredding in a song. You know what I mean? Well, one man who never subscribed to that theory was definitely Jay Maskus. That's Absolutely. <laughs> he, he said, forget it. I'm still going to show. How he much still I does it now. He's, just, yeah. he's never even even on the latest record, which I love as well. Yeah. He still just you know he's got the formula that works, and he and it, he smashes it out of the park. That's why I love yeah. it. Yeah, it's so great. And you said you know you you had the bass. Uh, you know, obviously in your household, not too hard to come by a, a bass. <laughs> They're mm, probably yeah. scattered around the house. So if you felt like picking one up and you know not taking it as seriously, that makes total sense because it's like right yeah. there you can fool around on it, and then one day you go, hey, I really want to really want to take this thing further well that was it i think for, for me it was like um for the first couple of years i was just quite happy to be able to play like smoke on the water totally <laughs> and seven nation army and all these little riffs that i learned totally. and then uh probably early teens was when i thought started to take it a bit more seriously yeah. and then uh i was probably in my first band when i was like 15 16 and we never even had a name, but we just had a few song, a few little songs that we wrote and then uh, mainly just enjoy playing covers. Um, and the, the first cover song we ever learned was for Hunda Bell Tolls. Nice. I love exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's what was interesting was I did a, 
I did a podcast uh, called Couch Riffs with uh-huh. um, this guy called Mike Squires. He has a really good podcast. And every time he has a guest on, they ask him to like pick a song and they do a cover with like other musicians who've been on the podcast. So when I told him that on the one I did, he was like, oh, we've got to do, we've got to do a cover of For Whom the Bell Tolls then. So I was like, all right. So then we got, we got <laughs> Jeff from Pumpkins to play lead guitar on it. And uh, the guys from AWOL Nation on vocals and drums. Uh, awesome. with me on bass and Mike on guitar and it came out really good it was like coming full circle that is so great I love it mm. I feel like there's uh when you said learn smoke on the water I was like I feel like that song was literally written so that young guitarists and bass players could have a riff that sounds it's everybody's impressive. first riff <laughs> totally because <laughs> you're you're doing boom 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 you know and I'm sitting there going bow 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 so exactly great. <laughs> it's so easy to play but it's just so, but so it sounds iconic. cool yeah, yeah yeah it's an iconic riff for I love sure. Deep Purple yeah absolutely I was wondering because you know you grew up you and your dad have such a cool relationship. You know, I did a little bit of research and I saw how during the um, during the pandemic, you guys would do these live video streams. And I just love the way you guys communicate to each other. It's really endearing. And it's cool to see that you have such a good relationship with your dad. Yeah, and we do. We do. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. You get to play mu- music with your dad and you guys get along really well. And I was wondering if during this time, you're a teenager, you're picking up the bass, you're listening to Dinosaur Jr., you're watching MTV. Was there a path where you were listening to something and your dad was like, ah, that sucks? <laughs> All the time. Yeah? All the time, yeah. Um, I mean, he he would sort of branch every band that I was getting into as just heavy music. Oh, he just yeah. loves heavy music. And I'm like, yeah. well, what does it actually mean? Right. You don't, you don't even know what bands I'm listening to. It's just heavy music, whatever, because... <laughs> You know, the thing was, like, with my dad, when he was a teenager, you know, he was like a hard rock guy, Led totally. Zeppelin, Deep Purple. But then what made him actually want to be in a band was seeing the Sex Pistols and the whole punk thing. Yeah. So, and he sort of dropped the, the 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 hard classic rock vibe and went more down the punk road, I think, because when you watch Deep Purple, you know, it's like so, and Led Zeppelin, it's like so technical and amazing. Yeah. But then, and he thought, wow, that's just... You know, I, I could never do that. But then when he saw the Sex Pistols, they were so rubbish, <laughs> and right, just literally, right. just literally telling the crowd to fuck off, as he puts it. Yeah. And as, as soon as he saw that, he thought I could do that. <laughs> totally. So, so that's <laughs> that, that's what made him want to be in a band. And then, uh, you know, that nowadays, I, I guess through because he he owned a club in Manchester called the Hacienda that started out basically started the whole like acid house movement in the late eighties and yeah. Now he's and now he does DJ sets where he DJs like dance music and I, I can't get on board with that stuff. But I guess uh, his his main thing now is more electronic and dance music, and then everything yeah. I listen to is just umbrellaed under heavy music. Heavy yeah. music, heavy music. I love yeah. it because I'm I'm a dad of two boys, and my oldest is 13, and I keep hoping he's gonna like hear the music that I love and be like, yes. But we just don't see eye to eye. He likes a lot of these, you know, because he grew up gaming. A lot of these games have, you know, uh, techno and mm-hmm. dubstep and these like heavy beats. And I, some of that we, I'm like, ah, eh, that's pretty cool. But we just went down a totally different path musically. And then I've got my seven year old and I'll play something for him heavy in the car and he'll just, you know, he'll headbang and I'll go, oh, he's got it in him. He's going <laughs> to, he's going to like the music I like. But, but you know, I, it's, it's not too late for your eldest. He might yeah, still, he might still know. find his, find his way down that path. He's got to find the angst. That's the thing is right now he's got so much um, happy positivity. He's got to really he's got to have his heart broken, maybe, maybe like mm. get in a relationship, break up and then pop on the cure and then and then get that rage out. Or, <laughs> you know. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, for me, when I was when I was sort of 10, 11, 12 and, you know, first start really listening to your own music, my favorite yeah. time was Oasis. Yes. And that was it because we were from Manchester. It was like, oh, these guys are incredible. They're from Manchester. Yeah. Look, look at what they're doing. And then, um, and I still like Oasis now. And um, oh yeah, 2019, the Pumpkins toured with Noel Gallagher. So that was I saw full, that. I saw that. That was, was another gonna... uh, full circle moment for me. Yeah. And then, um, but I sort of gravitated away from Oasis when I when I found all the American bands. You know. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> Being from Manchester, that's a big deal. You know, you have this sense yeah. of pride. Here's this band that's blowing up. You know, I think huge. I think these days you're just issued with a copy of. Uh, 
what's the story morning glory when you're born in manchester yeah when you're a mank they go <laughs> yeah, here you, you just, go that's it you'll need this and that's it <laughs> what are the other things what are the other signature probably something about your your uh, football team right manchester united yeah. Yeah, pick you're a, a pick big a football fan. team. <laughs> yeah, I am a big fan of United. You can see my uh, Man United base there in the background. <laughs> I love it. And then James <laughs> Eha even gifted you a custom strap, right, for Manchester. That's true. Yeah. Oh. He, um, at the end of our tour in 2018, um, he found this this lady in LA who's like sews all her own leather bags and leather guitar straps and with the you know custom stuff on. Sure. And he got he got us all a. Uh, a really nice guitar strap and mine was all with Man United stuff on it. So it'll look good attached to that bass when oh, I can, uh, when I can get back over there to play some shows. <laughs> Are you, um, so I'm not much of a sports fan in general. Just, just, I, I grew up in Oklahoma and mm. you're either in that part of the United States, it's football, American football, American football. And it's, that's like very, very, you know, pushed on you really hard. And so you either take to it or you don't. And I Mm. took to music. And so I never got into sports, but my, my question was, it seems that obviously soccer, your football has been huge all around the world and it hasn't really taken here. But recently with shows like Ted Lasso, it's starting to become much more mainstream. Do you like that it is? Do you like Ted Lasso and that whole energy behind that thing? I've only just started watching oh, yeah. it, so don't ruin it. Don't spoil it. No spoilers. No, no spoilers. Um, I love it. I'm a big Ted Lasso fan. I think it's great. Yeah, I, I, I love the premise of it. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's 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 interesting because obviously uh, his, uh, it's getting bigger and bigger in the States, which is it cool. Is. And I, 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 whenever I'm in America, I always look to see if I can go to any MLS games. Nice. Um, so I've been to a few. I've been to the LA Galaxy, mainly because – They've got some ex Manchester United players that have played for yeah. him in the past, like Beckham and Ibrahimovic. Yeah. And now uh, Javier Hernandez, who's their big sort of major star at the moment, who's playing for them. Um, so I always try and see MLS games. And it's interesting because when you go to an MLS game, the sort of home fans and the away fans mix together quite happily. Everyone's just having a good time, have this nice vibe. And it's like, wow, this is the total opposite of uh, what an English Premier League game is like, where the fans have to be all segregated and the away fans are not allowed to leave the stadium until an hour <laughs> after all the home fans have left because it's right. going to be fighting. Yeah. So it's actually quite nice going to a MLS game. Yeah. But I, what, what's going to be interesting is obviously the America, Canada and Mexico are hosting the World Cup in 2026. Yeah. Um, anyone who's listening to this who knows anything about European football will know that in Germany uh, at the moment, there are tons of young American players who are just right. in, look incredible. And they're all about 17, 18. So in 2026, they're all going to be like 21, 22. Right. And America is going to have a really good team for their own World Cup in 2026. And I think <laughs> my prediction is that that is the moment when soccer is going to be tipped over the edge and become mainstream in America. That's my you, bold prediction. You heard podcast. it here first. I hope we can play this <clears throat> audio clip and be like, listen, in 2022, yeah. Jack Bates predicted. I, I really wanted. do think, I think they're going to be really good and probably yeah. go further than England. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> boy, won't that piss so many countries off? I'm sure, mm-hmm. but uh, but yeah, I, I I've been to an LA Galaxy game because I was brought. I had a great time, but you know, sporting events. I drink yeah, beers. You're, you're in a, you're in LA now, right? That's where yeah, you I'm live. in LA. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I I I've been I've been to every single single uh, sporting event here because you know you have the opportunity when you live in a big city like this. Somebody goes, hey, we're gonna go see the Rams or mm-hmm. you know whatever. So. But anyway, I well, just you just, you just won the Super Bowl, didn't you? LA. That's right. We did. They sure made LA look cool <laughs> during that Super Bowl. I'll tell you mm. what. That was the funny thing is all of us watching, we were like, man, they went out of their way to make this look like the greatest place in the world to live with all these wide shots of the city. They they went out and cleaned everything up. And I was like, that's not what it looks yeah. like in that part of town. I, I had that feeling too. I was like, yeah. but that's the same thing when when they um when Manchester held the Commonwealth games in 2002 and yeah. they i remember watching the opening ceremony and they filmed this amazing montage of manchester it's like that's not what it looks like totally totally so i'm i'm leaking our secrets here to the world that uh, la was cleaned up and they did i mean are we even surprised it's hollywood they put a they put a brush <laughs> to everything right exactly 
but um, but I, I you did bring up going on tour back in 2019 with the Pumpkins, and you were with Noel Gallagher and AFI, and so that mm-hmm. was a huge moment being on the road with somebody who was so influential. Yeah. How how have other have you come across other artists and musicians that you were a fan of along the way that have been great moments? Has has Jay Mask has crossed your path? I've met Jay Maskis once, once and it was very, very, very briefly when me and my friend went to see Dinosaur Jr. And we just sort of caught him outside a venue. And, he, and you know, he's, he's famously a man of very few words. Yes. Um, so it was a very brief sort of, hey, how are you doing? And then he just sort of took off. But I, I count it as having met him. You can it was, count uh, it. Yeah. I have got a um, one of my friends in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, Jay Maskis played her local venue. And she got a a poster of the show and it's signed by him. And it says like, Hey Jack, I love your dad's bass from Jay Maskis. So I was like, ah, it's getting framed. And I'm clouting that as another time I've met him. (laughs) Absolutely. That's, that's Uh, what you want. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I've been lucky to meet a lot of uh, the people that have been some of my favorite musicians. Like I was, I was really sad this week because Mark Lanigan died and um, he was one of my all time music heroes that I've, eventually was fortunate enough to get to know and even ended up playing on what is now his last record. I saw um, that, yeah. So that was really sad this week, but, you know, just been lucky really through being able to tour the way we have done and spend yeah. a lot of time in America that you end up meeting a lot of these people who are, who are your heroes. Um, like it was funny yesterday, I was at the football um, I went to the United game and it was a, it was a nil nil draw. So we didn't even see any goals. So it was, kind of, it was kind of boring. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But it, it's what I love about watching the football now is that every time United play about 10 minutes after I'll get a text from Eric Avery of Jane's addiction oh, talking wow. about the game. And wow. that just blows my mind because totally. he's my number one ultimate favorite bass player. I love um, it. So it's amazing to have this sort of relationship with Eric where I can just bullshit about the football with him, you know? Oh, that's incredible. Mm. I love Jane's Addiction too. That was a huge yeah. band for me growing up. Eric yeah, Avery. me too. That's awesome. I, yeah, was, I, I was very lucky in the sense that I had, obviously Eric's been sort of in and out of the band over the years. And yeah. the first time I saw Jane's Addiction was when they did a co-headline tour with Nine Inch Nails uh-huh. on what they were calling the Ninja Tour. Um, and Eric was back for that one tour. So I have actually seen him play with James Addiction, which was brilliant. Yeah. It, he's not, I don't think he is currently playing with them, right? No, no. Chris no. Chaney has been the bass yeah. player for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And he's amazing too, to be honest. I've, yeah. I've, I've, oh, I've only met him once, but he was very nice. That's very cool. And, and I'm glad you brought up Mark Lanigan. It was heartbreaking that he passed. And I did see that you got a chance to record music and you guys even filmed um, a cover you know, that you did where it was virtually, I saw that, yeah. that was very cool. So such an important um, part of the, you know, Pacific Northwest and the Seattle music scene. And really, you know, uh, to people who know, they know Mark Lanigan, the rest of the world, it's like you could, you know, throw out screaming trees and whatnot and they'll, they'll go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The song from well, the, thing, the, the single thing soundtrack, is, you know. What, what often happens in times like this where someone passes like way before they should is that everybody else gets to know as a result. Yes. Yes. You know, so I'm pretty sure that there's going to be way more people who've been turned on to his, his solo stuff this week. Cause yeah. even the people who are like, oh, who's, I remember that guy, I'll go check out his music, you know? So that's, that, that's the one sort of nice thing you can take from it is that his music that he's left behind will be there for people to discover for forever. So yeah, absolutely. That's what but I it was. It was really sad. I was, I was really shocked and, and saddened on that. When was it Friday or Thursday? Whenever, yeah. whenever it happened, yeah, it was really sad. Yeah, I always really loved the um, the albums that he did with I- Isabel Campbell. I, I love mm-hmm. those. Those are such great. You know, sit down with a, a pint and stare off into space. Yeah, as they... I was just I was just talking to someone uh, yesterday about that actually because they were saying, "Oh, I've been listening to Hawk, one of the albums with Isabel Campbell." Yeah, and I was like, "Yeah, but that, that's good, but it's not as good as Ballad of the Broken Seas." Ballad of the Broken Seas. He... That's my favorite one. And then he was like, what? There's another one. I was like, mate, there's three. <laughs> there's three of them. <laughs> like, you need to go and you need to get back on uh, the Spotify or whatever and, and yeah. get get doing a deep diet because there's tons of shit that you've not even heard. 
Yeah. That's, that's the thing about artists, right? We, we put the work out in the world and, you know, sometimes it gets to a certain level of uh, acclaim or attention or people get to hear it. But then when we pass on, the music lives on, the art lives on and people get to share it all over again. So, well, that's it. You know, to me, I, I, the way I always look at it is like musicians, especially musicians like Mark, they never really die because they're always going to be here. You know, whenever I want to hear that stuff, I can put it on and it's there. And, you know, as, as someone that sort of got to know him and got to work with him, you know, that's the way we can, that I can remember, you know, just someone that had a big impact on my life, but not only musically really, because just, just getting to know him as a person, um, over probably over the last four or five years, like we text now and again, every, every couple of months we'd be in touch. So yeah. It's been really tough, but, uh, you know, that stuff will always be there for us to listen to, which is great. Well said. Well said. Well, let's jump into a little bit about how this journey with the Smashing Pumpkins even began. Um, I know that uh, you got a chance to meet Billy when you were a boy, but I'd love for the audience to kind of hear the story about how this connection started and and how you're playing with them now. Yeah, so um, a lot of people sort of, don't know or forget but in 2001 billy actually toured as a member of new order i remember so he was in he was in my dad's band at a time when i was sort of just hanging around backstage and mm-hmm. playing smoke on the water through the through the big <laughs> right. rig and thinking i was bow, like the coolest bow. kid ever <laughs> love it <laughs> so but obviously at the time I'm, I'm talking like you know i would be just 12 or barely 12 probably even 11 right um so i didn't really know who he was but he was to me. He was just a new guy in Dad's band. Yeah, but then that, you know, that tall two, guy. <laughs> yeah. So then, t- two or three years later, when when I became a huge Pumpkins fan, um, and I'm like, oh, that's that guy. No way. You know, I just didn't. I just didn't know. Um, yeah. So I've always been a big fan since since early teens, and then um, when we started touring as Peter Hook and the Light in 2010. Um, whenever we were in Chicago, we would get in touch with Billy and see if he wanted to come down and sing, which he always did. I think he did it probably like four or five shows in a row at the Metro in Chicago, where he'd always come down and sing a couple of Joy Division songs. And then we just got to know each other more and more through that. And then I guess as I was getting older um, and and touring with my dad, he could see that I was a decent bass player. (laughs) And then... uh, (laughs) Eventually, when they needed a bass player, they they it was actually Jeff that gave us a ring and said like, "Oh, we were thinking, maybe do you want to do you want to give it a go for this tour we've got coming up in summer?" And at the time, I thought, you know, it's just going to be a, it's just going to be a one off. Maybe I won't even be good good enough, and they'll just get rid of me after one tour. Right, and right. That seven years later, we're getting ready for the next tour. So it's been a it's a long story of uh, sort of goes back what twenty years now for me because I'm yeah. thirty two now. I guess I met him when I was eleven, twelve. <laughs> yeah. Which is quite interesting. But yeah, so it, it was pretty natural really, just through um, you know, I think my dad first met Billy when Billy was like sixteen. Really? Through uh through Joe Shanahan, who's a big figure in the Chicago music scene that owns Metro. Yeah. And uh so they've got they, you know, they go back years and years. And um now I do as well. And then so even before I was sort of joined the band as the touring bass player, I would go to see him every time they come to Manchester and we'd always, you know, pop backstage and say hello. Um, so I must have seen about more than 20 Pumpkins shows in the UK before I even started playing with him. And now I've played nearly 150 with him. So 150? Kind of, <laughs> yeah, I'm nearly there. Yeah, I think. Oh my God. That's I think added on this, up. Uh, I think on this April May tour that we're doing this year in a couple of months, I think that's when I'm going to hit 150, which is blows my mind. You know that I've blows had this mind. opportunity to uh, to play with in one of my favorite bands. It's just amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I'm the fan that gets to play on stage. Like literally, that is me. I know. You know, I, I'm such a huge fan, and I I uh, I, I think 
I've dreamed. My my mom always loved to tell me this story. I was like 13 years old and we were on a family car trip and I was like 13, 14 years old and I was asleep in the back. This is back when your kids could just lay in the back of a car with no seatbelts on and everybody was like, they'll be fine. Mm-hmm. And um, I was asleep in the back and I woke up and I started like kind of crying. I was really upset. My mom was like, what's going on? And I was like, I dreamed that I was in the Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> and, and, and then when I woke up, I realized it wasn't real. It wasn't true. Oh, but man. in the dream, I was playing. Playing with them, and I was all ready to go. So I've, I've, I have mastered uh, many songs so that if I was, I was ever put in the situation and get a chance to play, I'd be ready to go. But, there you uh, go, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, um, this time period that you met Billy is such an mm. interesting one in the timeline of things. Because for us that were, you know, a decade older than you, here's 2000, and this is the end of that chapter of the band. And we, this is, this yeah. is when you're meeting him and he's doing this stuff with new order and it's pre Zwan even. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's, yeah. that was like in the making, I think at that time. I've, I've only, I've only really, I've only really spoke to him about it briefly. And I think it was just a case of, you know, he, he was bored and looking for something to do and thought, of course oh, it'd, be, it'd be fun to tour with new order. I can't, I, and can't... I think it, it just sort of aligned because around that time, uh, Jillian, who played keyboards and guitar in New yeah. Order had left to take care of one of her one of her children who wasn't well as a child, um, and so they had an opening for a, a fill in guy and and got and got Billy. So <laughs> so so crazy cool. And then and mm. then this now that you've been with them since 2015, you obviously have played so many shows. So when you are out there and you have this massive back catalog you know, to, to have to learn and really mm. get familiar with, you know, all the old stuff, all the new stuff and know that where you're going. Has it been like, have, have there been songs that you go, this was a, this was a tough one. This was like a really beast oh, yeah. of a song and you know, I, it, you're almost exhausted by the time it's over. <laughs> yeah. A few of them. I mean, it, obviously like the majority of the catalog, Billy wrote the bass, Billy wrote and played the bass parts as totally. well as the guitar. Yeah. And um, so that it's actually quite handy because if I'm struggling with something, I can just go straight to the source and ask you can him, how did source. you play this? Yeah. <laughs> Which is a similar thing that I can do with my dad as well. So I guess yeah. it's like double cheating as a, as a, as a bass player. Yeah. But um, yeah, definitely. Like I hadn't played, you know, some of the, some of the early stuff from Gish and it's just hot, like Shiva. I really struggled with it at first just because there's so many changes and like, <laughs> totally. I just hadn't played like that before. Yeah. And, um, and you know, at the same time, it's like, am I even going to be able to keep up with Jimmy on these yeah. tracks? Because Jimmy's like one of the goat level drummers. <laughs> I'm so glad you said it because he is. And I go toe to toe with people on that all the time when they try to tell me who they think the greatest uh, drummer is. And I'm always not, like, I mean, <laughs> come it's on. Not even a, it's not, it's not even a contest for me at this stage. <laughs> totally. Having, totally. having been able to stand next to him for, you know, all these gigs and watched what he does at, you know, from six feet away. Yeah. It's just like superhuman drumming and he doesn't yeah. even break a sweat. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I'll look up at the end of like Shiva or Geek USA or something. It's just been our super Christ. It's just got yeah. mad drums. Yeah. And he's just like, yeah, whatever, you know, it's taking a drink of water. And I, I'm just oh. fucked, like totally sweating. And <laughs> it's just, it, that's the one thing about, to me, the first word that always springs to mind when I talk about Jimmy's drumming is just control. He's yeah. just totally in control. Even though the drums are, so complex and and yeah. crazy sounding. If you actually look at him, it's just total control. He doesn't even look like he's reaching for the drums. It's just totally just absolutely. Yeah, there's this physicality that drummers, you know, uh, vary from. Right, some that mm-hmm. it's like they have their full bodies going into it. You know, you would you would say the first time you see Dave Grohl play drums, he gets really animated, or he did when he was in in the height of Nirvana in that era. And Jimmy, when I when you'd see him, you'd go, wow, there's just so much, there's so much restraint, but yet he's playing that thing like a beast. Yeah. And so how does that body have so much force when his upper <laughs> torso seems like it's so still? It's just oh, yeah, it's, remarkable. It's, it's cr- it blows my mind, honestly. Yeah. I mean, and and playing songs like Shiva and and Geek USA and Super Christ, like I mentioned. Yeah. Um it's just Those amazing. But songs. even even like to be honest, some of the most impressive stuff is even on the slower stuff where he'll play with brushes and uh, and it's just like really, really technical, but yeah. obviously like a low level volume. But what yeah. he's doing is just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. He's well, amazing. And and I've obviously 
as a bass player, we're totally locked in together for you yeah, absolutely know, every show we've got to be so we rely on each other so much yeah and um it's playing with him has certainly made me a billion times better bass player than i was before so i can only really thank him for that yeah yeah i was gonna say that for the audience i was gonna say if you've never you know played in a band or seen live music the the relationship between the bass player and the drummer is crucial it has mm-hmm. to be locked in and uh and and I, you know have working with somebody that phenomenal he probably really was gracious in in figuring out how you guys can be on the same page and know where things are going so that he could play as much as he wanted to and in the ranges yeah. that he wanted to with with and that's a that's a challenge well, that's so. i mean for me i every it's funny because there's always this moment during a show where he'll do something crazy that he didn't yeah. do in practice you know yeah. what i mean and He'll look over as it just said, uh, did, you, did you catch that one? I'm like, yeah, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's like for my job is just to make sure the bass is so steady that it yeah. allows him to go off the rails like that and feel confident to just do some crazy ass fill that will blow my mind as well as the audience's. Yeah. And it sounds like as a bassist, you really were self-taught. I mean, here you have your dad is this, you know, famous bass player and all these legendary bands. And yet when you pick up the bass, you decided I'm going to forge my own path. I'm going to do my own thing. It's not like your playing style is the same as your dad's at all. It's, it's your own completely. Well, it's funny really, because, you know, <laughs> when some, a lot of people assume that, oh, your dad must have taught you how to play bass because he's, he was a bass player. Yeah. But the, the hilarious thing was is that when I was learning to play bass, my dad was actually saying to me, you, I can't teach you how to play bass because you're just going to end up sounding like me. Totally. And then, ironically enough, for the last 12 years, my job has been to sound like him. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, right. When you play along, so, you got to do yeah. those parts, right? So it was quite hilarious, really. But um, no, I mean... My dad is is one of the greatest bass players, but he would be the first person to admit that he couldn't play in the Pumpkins. Yeah, it's just it's just totally out of his wheelhouse. Like he's he struggles to play any music that's not his own, just because he yeah. can't get his head around a different yeah. way of working than what he's been doing for the last forty five years. Like he's got his way, yeah, and then other stuff is like over there. Yeah, and um, he always says like <laughs> I think. There was, there was a time when the Rolling Stones were looking for a new bass player and he was like fourth or fifth in line to be get an audition to be the bass player. Wow. And I, he always says, like, I was hoping that whoever was fourth was going to get the gig because if Mick Jagger asked him to play Satisfaction, he just wouldn't be able to do it because he just can't. <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 his mind just doesn't compute in that way. It's like yeah. I'm pretty good at listening to something and then doing it. Whereas yeah. with him, it's like, he just does his mind just doesn't work like that. So he's, yeah. he really only, I mean, and he's only ever had to play his own stuff because you know, it's so good. That's what people want to hear. So yeah. he can play that all day. But if you ask him to play something else, sometimes he struggles. <laughs> yeah. That, that makes sense because you know, the reason why he left such an impression on everybody in his career, and this is your interview, not your dad's, I'm, I'm you know, but for, for no, listeners, I'm, happy, I'm happy to give him the big shout out. Yeah. Like, but he, he was doing things that uh, I think a lot of bass players were like, Oh, we're allowed to do that. You know, so many bass hmm. players think I've got to play the low, I've got to hit all those things. And here he was doing these high, you know, upper two strings, the higher he was playing the bass, so much more melodically and yeah. making it a different part of the song. And so you can hear how that influence went on to all these other bass players to come down the road. So it makes sense why he would go, well, I can't teach you to do what I do because what I do is not what a bass player is quote yeah. unquote supposed to do. Right. And that, well, that's it. And you know, he can't read music. He doesn't even know what the notes are on the neck. He just, yeah. he just doesn't. Yeah. He's just never learned how you know you can't play scales. You can't do anything technical yeah. that, that people who learn instruments tend to learn how to do. And yeah. uh, so it's quite it's quite funny, really, that you can be such a legendary bass player without putting in all the hours with the music books. You know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Some of the greats are like that, right? They they just yeah. they, it wasn't about theory. It wasn't about yeah, the totally. notes. It was like what they felt. And well, his and, his his thing is his thing was always. Uh, because he didn't know anything of what he was doing when he was playing the bass, there was no rules. So he just yeah. made his own rules as if playing high up the neck is normal to me. So I'm going to do it like that. Yeah. And um, he always says to me that like once one time Bernard, the guitar player would say to him, like, can't you just follow the guitar? 
And he'd turn around and go, no, you follow the base. And that is essentially Joy Division. (laughs) Yeah, totally. totally. (laughs) It worked out pretty well. Yeah, it worked out pretty well. Made a unique Mm. sound. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yeah, incredible. Well, I, I got a chance, I think, if I'm on the timeline, right, since you played with them on tour in 2015, I went to the reunion show in L.A. in 2018, I think it was. Would that, that have been right. you up there? Yes, at the Forum. <laughs> I saw you play at the Forum. Oh, what a show. What a night. I was a, I was a weepy baby. I was sitting there and <laughs> the show begins and they're playing all these pictures on the screen and out Billy comes playing disarm. And I'm sitting next to my wife and just, just tears start falling down my face. And these two much younger than me girls are looking at me like, oh my God, what's this guy's problem? Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Amazing. Now there was, it was funny because uh, on that tour, there was certainly a, a lot of times where you'd look into the audience and people would just be crying. It's like, yeah, because it was, it was, I think it was the show that they never thought they'd see. Yeah. And yeah, there it is. Absolutely. Because, you know, I was there, I saw the pumpkins in 2000. I went to Univer- university of Illinois, Urbana champaign. And so I saw the machina tour and that was Melissa off was playing with them on that one. And, um, you know, it was everybody else was up on stage and I saw this tiny venue and then I saw them one last time at Evansville and then it was over. And when when a band breaks up, you do, all, you know, there's other bands that break up and get back together. you got bands like, you know, Sunny Day Real Estate or whatnot. You have these bands that they split, then they reform, they split, they reform. But you really got a sense back then. You're like, I may never see these guys in the same room. And so I, I described that show the the reunion tour that's like that ratatouille moment i don't know if you've ever seen ratatouille but it's like when he takes the bite of the food and suddenly he's transported back to his youth <laughs> like whipped back and i think that's why we were all crying is because somehow we were experiencing something that took us back in such a visceral strong I'm a kid again feeling and I'm in my car and I'm listening to this solo or this, this soft moment. And I'm thinking about how, you know, I just broke up and, or what, whatever it is, but it was very, very, very powerful. And that's, that's what music does, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> you can Definitely. see why I make the videos that I do, right? It's all, all my videos are ratatouille moments. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the interesting thing about talking to you now is because I've never spoke to you before other than Instagram DMs. Yeah. I feel like I know you because I've been watching your fucking videos all through COVID. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I know. So thank you for uh, entertaining us all during a very shit time. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think that uh, the stumbling across making, you know, nostalgic throwback videos about music, it was the right time to feel that feeling. And, and, uh, where I go from here, I don't know, but I, you know, this is what's been fun for me is I'm having, you know, Jack on the podcast and Kay on the podcast. And it's funny. Cause I was just, as we were talking about Jimmy, I was like, man, this is like the fifth time Jimmy has come up on a podcast that has nothing to do with the pumpkins at all. He keeps coming up cause I keep having drummers on the show <laughs> and you can't right. have a drummer on the show without talking about Jimmy Chamberlain. So mad props to that dude. Definitely. But, um, but your, your playing is, is, fantastic and obviously you don't miss a beat playing with the pumpkins and and uh you know it's it's one of those those things where is it when you're out there and you're playing these songs is it about i'm gonna do the bass line as it is in the song and and i'm gonna stay true to that or is there a a feeling like i've got to add something or change something no the the way i do it is just by listening to listen to the studio version over and over and over and get a sense of how it is on the record. Yeah. And then I'll go through live versions over the years. Yeah. See how see how Darcy played it. See how yeah. Melissa played it. Yeah. See how Nicole played it. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And just the different version. Because a lot of the times, like, you know, you mentioned Disarm before. There's like 10 different live versions of that one song. There's one that's like a speed metal version, one that's acoustic, one that's <laughs> yeah, like the record. Totally, totally. So I'll go through and listen to every single version I can find from every different incarnation of the band. And then just sort of familiarize myself with all of it. And then uh, I'll just show up ready how to play it however he wants to play, you know? And, yeah. then, and then at times I'll I'll learn something as if it's from the record. And sometimes they'll say like, oh, it's too straight like the record. Like, can you play it a bit like this? So I'd put a bit of that in. So there is a little bit of a free reign as well to sort of do maybe a little few little bits that aren't on the record, but that's always the starting point. 
Yeah. And I think that's that's the right. I mean, I, I agree with that decision. If I was in your place, I would go. That's probably why you have the job, because there's a reason why these songs have been put together in such a way that I think if you went to a live show and you saw somebody up there trying to change up a bunch of these amazing songs as as we've heard them, you'd almost be pissed off. You'd be like, hey, well, pal, yeah. what are you doing to these well, songs? Well, this is the thing. Like, <laughs> obviously, um, my dad's been out of New Order since 2006. Right. And right. They, got to, they got back together without him in 2011, and it's been a whole acrimonious court case level oh. thing for the last 10 years. But one thing that annoys me about the bass player they have now. I don't want to slag anyone off, but I will do anyway. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's slag him <laughs> off. He, he did an interview where he yeah. was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to not play them like, like they were played before. I'm going to put my own stamp on it. And yeah. I was thinking like, but that's some of the greatest bass lines anyone's ever written. And yeah. no offense, mate, but nobody wants to wear your stamp on it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely so, true. If, if, if I went to a show like that and I was a new order fan, I'd be a bit, as a bass player as well, I'd be like, why is he playing it like that? Can't you just play it how I like it? Yeah. So, and it's, it's got to so, sync up with the drums, like we talked about earlier. It's yeah. got to it's gotta land. If, and so that the person has to have a, a, a reverence for the music, mm. but also um, creative input that kind of matches where things are going, I think. And I think that that's, yeah. that's an important part of being a part of a band with a 30 plus year catalog of music, you know? Well, that's it. You know, it's all, it's cool if you want to make the songs your own, but you know, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever do an interview saying, I'm going to make these Smashing Pumpkins, but I'm going to put my own stamp on it. Totally. It's like, no, I'm a fan that yeah. wants to hear it played how I remember it when I first heard it, like your videos. Here's yeah. your face when you first heard the Everlasting Ks or whatever. <laughs> you know, yeah. I want to play it like that. Totally. So that's what I try and do. I love it. I love it. I'm going to be seeing you guys actually uh, on one of your States shows. I'm going to the one in May. I think it's like Redondo Beach. It's like a it's like a festival type thing. So I'll be there at the oh, show. Right. So so we'll what, have what to. About, we're doing we're doing one the day before as well, aren't we? In uh, Santa Barbara. Is oh, that any, that's near you, right? I saw that. Yeah, that's not too bad. It's that's a, a little bit of a drive, but hey, I'd make it work. Well, <laughs> so you got, I should you go to the, both. You got the hookup for the tickets. Just yeah. Give me a text. Yeah, baby. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, Jack, this has been a pleasure, man. I mean, we got a chance to dig into, uh, I think the only other question is I wanted to know before we get out of here, was there any, would there be any music that you had as a teenager that you would, um, that was your guilty pleasure? That was your, your, you wouldn't necessarily be hanging around with your friends and say, I listen to this. <laughs> Do you have you know an what? album that is like, it's a little embarrassing. Someone asked me this the other day yeah. and my answer would be Will Smith, Will any of Yes, that's <laughs> that, a great that whole, choice. That whole album, oh. Miami, getting jiggy with it and all oh, that. I used hell to love yeah. that shit. <laughs> you know what? It may have been embarrassing back then if you were in a rock band, but the great thing about time is now that when we all listen to that album, it brings us back and you're what suddenly... Was the, what was the other one? Is Because there's Will Anyum. I was Will 2K. I don't know. There was <laughs> something like that. But no, Big Willie style. Maybe Big it was Willie that one. style. I don't know, but it is yeah, definitely that. I would be the that would be the guilty pleasure as a teenager. Solid choice. <laughs> see, <laughs> that's what started, I wanted. Yes. It all started with Men in Black. You see that theme tune. When I heard yeah, that man. when I was eight, I was like, "This is the coolest thing I've ever heard." Oh, absolutely! <laughs> Everybody was moving to Men in Black. The movie. Yeah. The that was back when you had you know you had a musician who was the lead in a film, and so he, they got the song for the film. That was a big part of that era. Totally. Right? <laughs> Music video and all that. I remember totally. it all. Yeah. So good. So good. Well, Jack, this has been awesome. Thank you so much. Make sure you check out Jack's work. You know, he's playing with, with Peter Hook and the Light. He's playing with the Smashing Pumpkins. He's out there. He's got a lot of uh, amazing music that he's contributing. And uh, he's a great follow. So you should follow his social media. So he's easy <laughs> to find. Um, and uh, yeah, make sure you go check out the Smashing Pumpkins on tour. They're they're about to head over here shortly. So well, yeah, you it's going to be, uh, I, think, I think I'll be flying out at like, mid to late april start rehearsals and then we've got like a five or six week spring run uh all over kind of all over like the southern states yeah a lot of it's in sort of that neck of the woods texas alabama new orleans kind of and we're going down to mexico too um we've i think one night in mexico city quickly became four at the oh, moment wow. or maybe even five i don't know what the fuck's going on yeah <laughs> they want to see you so, in mexico city apparently well, that's right? it. it just the, every time they put a new date on sale it just blows out and um that's the one that i'm really excited about because i know from 
I love Mexico and I love going to Mexico City. And I know from touring with my dad, um, he plays, whenever he plays in Mexico City, it's his biggest crowd. It's the craziest crowd. That's so cool. And I've, and I've always thought like, um, God, it must be mental to play over the pumpkins. Like it's going to be huge and it's not happened yet until now. So it's going right. to be really exciting. That's great. That's great. And then, uh, yeah, my dad, my dad is coming through North America in August and September uh playing the first two joy division records and no pleasures and closer um and i think i'm gonna be on the tour so awesome I, I, yeah i think uh august september should be good i can i'm trying to juggle both bands this year yeah yeah absolutely um, so yeah i would uh if for any joy division and new order fans that haven't been to see his show uh i would recommend it even as a band absolutely member. Yeah, absolutely. Peter Hook and the Light. Make sure to look for when he's on tour and playing in a city near you. And when I see you in May, you better be further on Ted Lasso so we can talk about it. I'll have finished it by then. Yeah, so we can good, talk about it. Good, Catch up so it's, we can talk about Ted Lasso. It's hilarious because uh, at the moment, my my team, Man United, we've got a, like an interim manager because our manager got sacked and we've got a new manager. But he's just till the end of the season. And his assistant manager is an American guy that doesn't really have, you know, he's not got the, the massive football CV or sure. whatever. And there was a news story the other day that a, a section of our squad is calling him Ted Lasso behind his back. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So there you go. There you go. I love that so much. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining me and Jack Bates on Waterproof Records, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>